And so, I mean, yeah. thank you so much for, for joining us today. You know, what I'm trying to do is educate parents and athletes about college programs. And I believe that there's not enough people informing, not just the, the juniors and seniors in high school, but the age group below that. And, you know, like my little brother, for example, um, is, is a great, great um, example of this. When he was like year 12, which is like his junior year here in New Zealand, he was over at the US Open, you know, playing in the, in the under 18s. And there were so many coaches that were interested in him. He was about 63 ITF at that time. And um, when all these coaches are talking to me about him, it, it, we, we couldn't make it a reality because some of the eligibility stuff wasn't done. And if he'd known that a few years earlier, it would have been sorted. And so what I'm trying to do is educate, go into schools, but also tell them about what you're looking for, how you run things. Because, you know, if kids are around here like mucking around and they're really talented, they're going to miss out on opportunities. And we don't want that for them. What a, what a cool mission. I love that. And I think that's, you know, I remember your brother quite well tricky player and and uses all parts of the court and and knows what he's doing out there and would have been I mean a multiple time all-american and a great college player and I think guys like that as a coach I've seen the same thing with recruiting where you you fall in love with a kid and his family and you know that he'd be a great fit but then some decisions that have been made either in terms of contracts or in terms of uh, academics a few years earlier yeah. They, they can't be undone. And so yeah. I love the mission, love what you're doing and, and hope I can help. Absolutely. So before we get started, I mean, let's talk about yourself. How did you get into tennis yourself? So I've got an identical twin brother and nice. uh, we grew up just absolutely grinding against each other. Yeah. And I would say both of us probably valued competing a little bit more than technique, you know, just out yeah. there kind of hacking at each other and just grinding and, and enjoying the competitiveness. We played all sports. I, I was really fortunate that a former Marquette player in Milwaukee area ended up sticking around to teach some youngsters in the Milwaukee area. And he was from Indonesia and was a phenomenal mentor and coach. And we just lucked into seeing him uh, at a summer camp when we were nine or 10 and stayed all the way through to when we had the opportunity to play college tennis. And right. so really special relationship with, with Robert, who I'm still close with and his sons have played college tennis now, just a great person. And uh, my brother was at the university of Iowa and was making a little bit of a mess of his life with off court decisions. And, you know, that's a place where you can do a little partying and he was partaking in that. Yeah. And his coach actually made a huge difference on his life, less about tennis and more about uh, goal setting and, and setting the right priorities. And he went from uh, being someone who, you know, had really struggled academically and socially and, and also with his tennis to someone who got a 4-0 his last two years and set him up to be really successful out of college. He ended up going to Harvard Business School, graduating wow. top, top 5% of his class there. Nice. And so I had a front row seat to seeing how a coach can impact uh, a young person's life. And so that was sort of the seed that was planted for me I loved college tennis myself. I got to play at Northwestern, which was a great uh, Big Ten school and had, a, had an amazing experience there with my coaches. But I think seeing my brother's experience, Aaron's experience at Iowa, um, was what really got me intrigued about coaching. And so when I, when I graduated, I started for a few years at Wilson Sporting Goods and was in the I was in the scouting and signing department there for tracking some young players as they are making the transition like your brother to, to professional tennis. And we, we had a successful few years. Um, Milos Ranić was one of the guys that we were able to sign when he was, he was 700 ATP at the time. So that ended up being a good one. (laughs) How old was he then? uh, He was actually not an amazing junior, believe it or not. I mean, it, all things considered when you're when you're talking about superstars that end up top five in, in yeah. ATP rankings he I remember him losing first round at the Orange Bowl and wow. you know he he was a bit slow on the court still growing into his body the serve was always special um, but yeah I, I loved the process of seeing a 16 17 year old and watching them 
develop and and who's gonna be the person like Milos who is you know 500 ITF but now five ATP and obviously as you know there are some guys that are five ITF who end up only 500 ATP and so that process of development and the choices that young people would make to set themselves on a path was really interesting to me and I think those two pieces my interest in, in helping people like coach Houghton at Iowa help my brother. And then also this fascination with um, the development process from, from elite juniors to successful pros. Those two uh, interests are, are combined in college tennis. And so that's what got me going with coaching. That's incredible. And so you, you thought about, yes, this is what I want to do. I want to be a college coach. Tell us about a few of the universities that you've worked with. Obviously, you've had an amazing career. I've read up about it. Um, <laughs> Thank you, you. Can you talk about it a little bit more? Sure. So I think the, the first dive into college coaching, I, I have to credit my wife because Wilson had been going well. I was engaged and, and then just about to be married. And I come to tell her, hey, you know, this first job is 26 grand and <laughs> I'm, I'm on this dream for college coaching. Yeah. And she, she knew that was a passion and it was, you know, I said, Hey, I want to bet on myself in this. I think I could be good at it. And I, you know, I know that I'm going to have to grind a few years financially and also just learning from some elite coaches because I know the, I know the pro game. I know some of these attributes that are necessary to succeed yeah. at the slam level but that's different than actually being in the trenches and, and being a part of the everyday process. And I knew that there was a lot of learning involved. And right. so I, I went and joined Arvid Swan at Northwestern, who I had a really strong relationship with as a player when he had been the assistant coach and one of the hardest workers in, in all of tennis. And I spent a year there and then the University of North Florida job opened. I had never even heard of that university at the time. Right. I had a rich tennis tradition in D2 and had, con had recently uh, gone to D1. And they offered the job to a close friend who in turn gave them my name. And right. so I got a call out of the blue. You know, I have one year of experience at Northwestern thinking I'm going to be there for four or five years. And the AD called me uh, driving into Northwestern one day and asked me to come down and interview. And I was 27. I, I can admit, I, I really wasn't a phenomenal coach at that point. I was trying hard and, and learning, but I think expertise wise, I still had a long ways to go. And I, I was able to spend a couple of years at university of North Florida. And what was special about my time there, one being a head coach at that age, you just have to learn quickly. Yeah. You know, you're jumping in the deep end of a pool. But then the other special part was Todd Martin, Brian Gottfried, and Claudio Pistolese were in the Jacksonville area through connections with the ATP. And most of the courts in that area are clay courts, the hard true. And we had some of the only hard courts around. So Brian Baker is coming through town and he's working with Todd Martin and they would come use the, the hard courts at North Florida. And Brian Gottfried would have some elite juniors getting ready for a tournament and they'd want to come and hit for a few days at our court. So these relationships started building and it, it gave me an opportunity to, to really learn from some phenomenal coaches. Uh, all three of those guys are some of the best tennis coaches in the world. So I would just, you know, go sit at Sawgrass as they were working with players on the clay courts there. And yeah. when they would come out, I'd, I'd stay after practice and spend an hour or two and just ask questions and take notes. And um, developmentally, that was a really helpful few years for me to really learn the game from elite and experienced coaches um, and gave me a different insight than my time at Wilson, which I would say was more of a bird's eye view. And I was actually seeing the decisions that Todd was making with Brian Baker before he goes and plays a slam. Here's, here's how I want you to build your serve plus one. Here's how you, your footwork after, after the return needs to be cleaned up. And that was a, that was a phenomenal learning experience. And I owe those guys a lot for being willing to have, have me following them around, taking notes. And then I spent uh, five years at Notre Dame yep. and Ryan Satry, you know, really changed my life. North Florida, we, we had been top 50 there. We had a strong recruiting class. 
but I would say we were a little bit removed from the elite levels of college tennis as, as much as we were trying to get there. And I felt going to Notre Dame and being an assistant again and really learning from an, another elite coach in, in Ryan, I felt like if we wanted to be top 10 someday as a head coach, I needed to go somewhere and be top 10 and, and recruit at that level and develop at that level. So we spent five years in South Bend with, with Ryan and some amazing student athletes there. He had, he had a really good program in place. And so the first year there, we actually uh, got up to six in the country and Quentin Monaghan, Greg Andrews, both uh, incredible players. Quentin became a multiple time all American. Alex Lawson is now 120 ATP and doubles was multiple time all American there. And I owe those players and, and Ryan a lot as well for giving me an opportunity to really build my confidence, you know, that I could coach, recruit, develop with some of the best college coaches in the country. So we, we felt at Notre Dame that the only way we were leaving there was for a, a dream job and a, an opportunity to be somewhere for a long time, uh, you know, weren't interested in just hopping around. And that's why we were there for five years. And Pepperdine, when it became available, I, I wasn't sure that I, I felt like there must be other folks out there with stronger resumes that would be interested, but I was yeah. certainly interested on my end. And you felt like it was a bit of a sleeping giant, you know, Steiny and Peter Smith and Alan Fox, the, the coaching legends that have come through here have been amazing. Um, but they had gone through a four or five year dip. And so yeah, it was really exciting to be able to, to come to a place where you feel like you can recruit the very best players in the world and, and be in Mallow. I mean, I don't know if there's a place that's, you know, better to come tough. into work every day. Yeah, I mean, tough life, right? Living in uh, Malibu with that beautiful tan, mate. <laughs> you got good, 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 good luck uh, convincing my wife to go anywhere else, right? <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, I know, man. Like you've got it, you've got it hooked now on Malibu. So I don't think you should want to leave. I mean, there's so many athletes that know about Malibu, but Malibu, but have never been. Um, tell us a little bit about the setup that you got there at Pepperdine. Yeah, so I think the number one thing that I love about Pepperdine before you get into even Malibu is just tennis is a big deal here at Pepperdine. Um, you know, being at other Notre Dame is an incredible athletic department and football and basketball are huge there. And I think there are many other power five programs where the, the support for athletics in general is, is quite strong here at Pepperdine. It's maybe the athletic department overall is a bit smaller, but golf and tennis uh, and some of those non-revenue sports are a big, big deal here. And so that for me is there's a little pressure that comes with that because they know here at Pepperdine from, from a department standpoint that they, we can compete for national titles. And I think as a coach, you know, coming in with a program that was outside the top 200, it was like, all right, we better get this rolling if we want to meet the expectations. But coming back, I mean, we were at NCAAs in Orlando and the president of our university came down to do a graduation ceremony with one of our doubles players. Wow. And I, I don't know many other universities where something like that would happen, yeah. you know, to, to care that much and to be that fired up about women's tennis being in the finals and men's tennis, having a doubles team in the semis, they, it, it mattered a great deal here. So that's, that's really awesome. And then the connection to pro tennis, you know, we're, we're about an hour from Carson where the USTA has a headquarters out here in California. Stevie J is, is out there pretty frequently. Sam Query grew up about 20 minutes from Pepperdine and comes out to, to hit with our guys from time to time when he's in town. And so the, the connectedness to pro tennis is, is helpful. And then weather and just the, the scenery and, and the environment of our facility, I think is, is pretty special. You, you feel walking out on the courts, like, all right, I'm, I'm lucky to be out here today. It's, uh... it's, it's incredible. I mean, I've never been to Pepperdine, but a few of my friends have. Actually, one of my mates played for Pepperdine a few years ago, Finn Turney. Um, yeah, did quite well. So, I mean, he... he, he he's one of those guys in college tennis that you want on your squad. You know, he's, <laughs> he, he, he's one of those guys you want. He's not afraid to get into the dogfight. And yeah, yeah. He's, a, he's a tough, tough kid. So, yeah. well, now he's not a kid anymore. But I mean, for college tennis players, he's about as good as it gets. 
He's incredible. Like Finn stopped playing tennis. So he Finn's like 29 years old guys that are watching this. And he he's from Wellington, New Zealand, trained at the Planet Pro Tennis Academy with head coach Clint Packer, went to Pepperdine, was a top junior, and just crushed it in college tennis. I think he finished like number two in, in doubles and like 14 in singles or something. And uh, came back to New Zealand, you know, played Davis Cup and all of that stuff. And then he likes he put his rackets down for like a year. Like he just didn't play any matches. I remember this, but he came he back and came back and just won everything. <laughs> like, yes, won everything. Like, the guy's an absolute talent. Um, and I'll be talking to Finn about Pepperdine, and he's like, mate, just go watch one of the Hawaii movies, and it's like that. Like, the, the setting is just amazing. The water's clear. Like, you're, you're feeling like you're in a movie set. Um, but I mean, you got the big blue tennis courts there, they look absolutely incredible. How many people turn out to come watch your matches? So that's one of my big goals now that we've got the team heading in the right direction is to make it a bit more of a, a community atmosphere. You know, I think with COVID, it, it was tough everywhere, you know, with some of the challenges to having fans. But in the in the Steiny days, Nick Carlos was helping out. He's the head coach at Cal Poly now. And, and when Finn and some of those other boys were here, they were getting the grandstand full with several hundred people. And we with the team dropping off the last few years, we've got some work to do in that area. But it's, uh, I, I'm pretty confident with how important tennis is in the area that we're going to, when the team's both having a lot of success, that we'll get it rolling again. Absolutely. I mean, you guys have also got some like incredible players that for those that are watching this, go check out them on, online on City Roster, check them out on UTR. They got some talent. They've got some talent over there, which is amazing. Um, in terms of, when you're recruiting athletes, obviously being in such an amazing location, you're going to be getting a lot of emails from a lot of different people and athletes around the world. What, what is a recruiting red flag for you? Great question. Yeah, I think the, so we're, we're a bit unique in our roster building because you, you know this, Amrit, with it, how, how coaches can use the four and a half scholarships. Yeah. There are some schools where maybe it's a little bit less expensive or there's a lot of combinable aid through academics or, or other opportunities. With Pepperdine, four and a half scholarships is really four and a half scholarships yeah. and the school is quite expensive. And so when we're building out our roster, we are really looking in two directions. One, absolute studs that we can compete at the top of the lineup with anyone in the country. And so we're, we're going against SC, UCLA, Georgia, Florida, you know, blue blood programs with some of these elite athletes that have ATP points or, you know, Guy who came last year made semis of the French open juniors. And then the other half of the roster, and, and this is really maybe unique to Pepperdine and where I, I actually enjoy it and feel like it's a great fit for me as a coach is we also need to recruit some student athletes that are able to pay a, a good percentage of the, the, the yearly fees at Pepperdine and, and the tuition and, and living expenses. And that's where it can get pretty fun as a coach to take some more project type of players where maybe their game hasn't fully come together yet Yep. And coming into an environment with other great players with really heavily invested coaches. You know, we have three coaches that are all young, energetic, love development um, and, and make serious growth. And I think that's actually both sides help each other. You know, having guys like a Robert Shelton, who was 90 in the U.S. and a pretty overlooked recruit. He was the one who clinched our match when we beat USC this spring. And having a guy like that make such a massive jump is pretty inspiring for some of these other guys who have already been there, done that with the junior and, and pro level. And I think on the other side, Robert Shelton, you know, starting to win some sets in practice against guys who have points and have a uh, UTR above 13. That's validating for him to say, wow, I'm, I'm really am making this serious growth. It's not that, you know, Adam and Tassi and the coaches are just telling me it. I, I can see the, the evidence of my improvement. And so we really, while we're recruiting, are looking in both uh, arenas, you know, both areas for, for players that are interested in developing. And I think for me, the two biggest red flags um, at Pepperdine 
One is we really are looking for hungry players that are excited to develop. Um, and that might sound a bit cliche, but I, I would guess that there aren't too many head coaches that spend more time on the tennis court. I love doing individuals. Uh, most days, including practice, I'm on the court for seven or eight hours. Um, and it's not a situation where we have the head coach doing administration and travel and things like that. And then the assistants are doing development. It's all three of us are on court. And so I look at it as if we have a kid who isn't excited about coming in for an individual outside of team practice. And, and it's something where we've got to do a bunch of motivation. That's just going to over time suck a lot of the joy out of, out of, out of our experience as coaches. You know, we want kids that are look at that as an opportunity and are fired up to, to get some one-on-one -on -one time. And when we say, Hey, you have unlimited individuals outside of team practice, you know, within the NCAA rules, Yes, that would, that fired me up when I was a player. And, you know, I know for me, my family could afford one private lesson per week before I went to college. And so when I got to college and Arvid as the assistant was saying, Hey, I'll hit with you four days a week. I, I thought that was, it blew me away. And uh, you know, we're looking for, for young men that have that same kind of gratitude and, and hunger to improve. Yep. And then the second piece is, you know, we, we really need kids that are the right fit. Uh, Pepperdine is smaller school. It's, there's no alcohol on campus, which is pretty different, you know, having a dry campus versus a lot of other schools. We don't have a football team. And so we are a unique program when you compare us to other top 25 programs around the country. And so we are looking for young men that recognize those differences and they might go on a visit to Florida, Texas A&M and UCLA and then come to us and we're different. And so I'm very open and direct about those differences. So, so that there's an understanding before we have commitments. And if, if we feel like uh, there's a prospect who some of those other aspects of the college experience are really important. I think it's, it's okay for us to agree that the fit just isn't there and we're not going to fight that tooth and nail to try to make Pepperdine into something that it's not. We're very open about what Pepperdine is. And we feel like when young men are really serious about developing holistically and also really trying to push yeah. for the pro tour, this is a place where they can do that. And so I, you know, red flags, most of that stuff comes out. And if we're direct and honest, I, I feel like most of the time with recruits, they can be, and, and I've had plenty of conversations where I've loved the family, loved the kid and just said, Hey, you know what? I'd love to connect you with some other great coaches, but Pepperdine might not be the, the place for you. That's amazing. You know, guys, not many coaches are like Adam. That's amazing how, you care not just about the recruit, but also the person that's investing their time in you. You're caring about their future as well. So if it's not the right fit for you, you're happy to push them on and connect them with other programs. That's absolutely incredible. Um, if an athlete, you know, was, the, let's say, the two years out from graduating high school and they're going to go to college in a two and a half years time, what's more important, playing ITFs or playing a number of UTR matches? Great question. Yeah, that's yeah. You're getting into the nuts and bolts of it there. <laughs> I, I I think that uh, the UTR ratings right now are maybe the most important aspect of a recruit's profile. You know, to most coaches I speak to, if they had a, a recruit that had no ITF standing but was a mid thirteen level player, they'd have no issues with recruiting that player. I, I do think that there's an experience and an exposure that the slams offer. And yeah. you know, that with your brother, um, it's just a special thing for, for an 18 and under player to go and, and experience and they get a taste for a, a pro tennis experience. They get a taste for, you know, what kind of decisions are available with sponsors and, and things like that. So I do think the ITF circuit has some, huge advantages still, even with the, the rise of UTR. Yeah. But I, I just feel like, um, you know, my family couldn't have afforded that, you know, when I was in 18 and under. So we were fortunate to be in USTA and I, I just wasn't good enough to be a global elite junior anyway. But I think 
I recognize that some families, the UTR is just a much better path financially. And I, I would encourage anyone who's listening, who feels a little overwhelmed with some of the, the requirements to pursue ITF all the way, that you're still going to have some opportunities if, you, if you're committed to growth and development and you're going and winning matches at the UTR level, you're going to be just fine. I even tell athletes, like if they go play club into club and they're playing against a guy that might be five years older than, older than them and they don't want to go professional, they might still have a good UTR. And you can use that as well to present your case to college coaches why you should deserve that scholarship. And, um, you know, I guess, like, how many matches would you like to look at? Would you like to, would you look at, like, the 20 to 30 matches on UTR or maybe five good matches? What sort of things stand out for you? So I would just, you know, I'll use an example from our team, Pietro Felin, who is a soft, you know, he's in his second year I, through COVID. I guess he's technically just finishing his right. freshman yep. year now. But he won his last nine matches. Uh, turned into an absolute stud for us down the stretch beat beat usc beat tcu beat oklahoma state you know beating guys as high as top 600 atp he was actually an 11-2 utr when he first reached out and that's under where you know you you you, amrit you know our, our team we have most of our guys are in the 13 utr range and he fell into that Hey, I'm going to, I'm going to respond to this kid, but he's, he's probably a bit too low. And so we just began the conversation and here's where I would encourage anyone who's listening, who might be in that range. Pietro made it very clear that number one, he had his academics totally squared away and felt confident in his ability to really prioritize his tennis for the last 18 minutes, 18 months before college. And then he did a really nice job of, continuing to initiate because when you're not a top top prospect for an elite school the coach might not be the one who's always carrying the conversation and I think Pietro did a really nice job of six weeks later hey coach I just want to let you know I'm an 11-4 now and I got back from this tournament I played really well and he, I played this 12, six and learned a lot from the match and six weeks later, you know, staying in touch again. And I, I started to really trust Pietro's confidence and his vision for his own development. Yeah. And I visited him in Milan when he was an 11, seven, you know, I was just tracking on this process for you. And by the time he came to Pepperdine, he was a 12, two, 12, three, but he had some 13 UTR level wins. And then he really struggled his first year here, you know, and, and it was tough for him and challenging for him. And he's scratching and clawing for opportunities to play and new, new experience coming to America from Italy and, you know, different educational environment, different coaching atmosphere. But he has been a, a great fit at Pepperdine and in his second year, ended up making massive contributions to our program. And I think if you went back to his junior year of high school, when he was an 11, two, you would say it's pretty hard to see him being that stud who won, who was nine and in his last nine matches. And I think he has some upside to not just be a five or six guy, but to be an elite college player. And I think Pietro has strong interest in playing at the next level and, Really what's most important to me is rate of development and efficiency that a player shows more so than current level, because ultimately you're going to catch other guys like Pietro has, if your rate of development is faster than anyone else around you. Yep. So I just, I think there's two lessons from that that maybe would be encouraging to other folks listening in. And one would be that, it's okay to lead the conversation as a prospect and it's okay to continue reaching out to a coach. Um, and, and it might take being fair and I don't want to be revisionist about this, looking back at how valuable Pietro has been to our team. Now, I, I would say it took five or six interactions before I took Pietro seriously, you know, yeah. and, and said like, Hey, this guy could actually be a nice get for us. And I give the credit to Pietro, not to myself, that he continued reaching out and felt like 
Pepperdine would be a good fit for him. And it ultimately has become a, a great fit for both sides. Um, so yes, it's okay to lead the conversation. And then the second thing is when you show evidence of a strong rate of growth and, and an efficient way of improving, I think most coaches will, you know, coaches that are worth their salt are going to be interested in that, you know, when you, when you can show that kind of jump. Absolutely. Well, I mean, I know a lot of kids and coaches also are going to take a lot of valuable information from this. I had a player that uh, wanted to go to Seattle last year and he started reaching out to the coach. We started talking to the coach. Um, the coach at that time wasn't really keen to make a decision. And when coaches say that they're sort of looking around and, seeing who else is out there, you know, wonder how sure. it goes. And um, I just said to my athlete, send updates every week of what you've been doing well, what you've been working on. And I guarantee you that their coach will, will want to invest in you. And he's going to Seattle this August. And so, you know, like there's, there's a lot of athletes that go the extra mile and keep those dialogues up with the coaches. Um, we had the University of Washington golf coach here in New Zealand, and she said the exact same thing that, you know, athletes messaging her, updating her on scores, even when you can't talk to athletes when they're too young, the athletes can still email coaches and they just compile all that information. So keep that in mind, guys. But look, Adam, you've been an absolute legend. Thank you so much for coming on here. I know you're a busy man. Um, you've got a family to get back to. But look, best of luck for the, for the August season, for the fall season coming up. And guys, check out their Instagram, Facebook and website. Follow them. It is amazing. You've listened now straight from the horse's mouth exactly what he's looking for and what are red flags. Now it's time to apply it and make sure that you're positioning yourselves in a good way to go play at Pepperdine. So thank you so much, Adam. I appreciate your time. Thank you, Amrit. appreciate what you're doing. Your mission is awesome. It's, it's a great educational thing, but you also have a lot of fun. So it's, it's great feeling that coming from your end. Cool. Thanks, brother. Appreciate it, man.